Welcome to the Expansive CEO Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Chapman, founder of Expansive CEO and X Squared Wealth Planning. Buckle in as we explore how to create true prosperity and build a business and a life that expands beyond yourself and makes a dent in the universe. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Expansive CEO Podcast. I am your host, Hannah Chapman, and today my guest is Sage Polaris, who is a copywriter and launch specialist. And beyond that, we're, we're not going to talk about a lot of that today um, because we have a very special topic that we're going to talk about here since this podcast is dropping in July of 2024. And what happens in July of 2024, it's July. So a lot of us are trying to figure out how to take some time off. We have kids who are out of school for the summer, or, you know, we just need that, that spaciousness in our calendar to go up to the mountains or go to the beach. Uh, and as entrepreneurs, that can be really tough to navigate, especially in your early years, or if you, you know, haven't really built systems in place that will allow you to pull back without um, completely stopping the flow of business, right? So Sage has what she calls the time off business model. Um, and we're going to talk about that a lot today. So Sage, thank you so much for being here. I would love for you to share a little bit of your story and how you got to where you are. And of course, like we're going to weave into there, like why the time off business model matters and, and how you, how you got there. Yeah. I'm so excited to have this conversation and thank you for having me, Hannah. I really appreciate being able to share this with people and, you know, it's interesting, like when you quit your job and decide you're going to be a freelancer or maybe you have a side hustle, uh, we often tend to become our own worst boss. Like we think we're getting away from someone who can control our time and all those things. But then, you know, I remember when I started my business, I would have given anything for it to be successful. So I was actually working at the California Science Center. I was installing art for museums and it was such a great job. I was freelancing, but I was still an employee. So whenever I would go to a different museum, install the show for them, I would be with them for a set amount of time. And then I would leave for a while and then come back and deinstall the show. And it was great because I had all this free time in between jobs and I started to discover this whole idea of online marketing and writing words on websites that help people sell more of their service or product. And I was just falling in love with this idea of building connections in the online space. Like to me, that's all copywriting is, is like you get to connect people together together someone has a problem, the other person has a solution, and then you build community around creating solutions for people. And I love that. I think it's an amazing way um, to really foster connections in a meaningful way in the online space. So when I was working at the museums, though, like I was trying to figure out like how I was going to become my own boss. Like, what was that going to look like? How was I going to figure that out? And then I unexpectedly got pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and had to figure it out real quick. So my son is 12 and my business is 12. So you can Amazing. figure out how that thread happened. And um, I'm grateful because it created a level of focus for me. It made me make some very big decisions about how I wanted to basically dive straight into being my own boss. Like I, I don't wish that scenario on everyone. And I kind of recommend like people make that transition slower than I did. But at that time I felt like, well, I just, I didn't know what kind of mom I would be. And I completely fell in love with my 12 year old who was a baby at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make this work. Like I'm putting in my two weeks notice. It was kind of wild. Like the California science center at that time, it was a very iconic moment in Los Angeles where we were getting the Endeavor shuttle. Mark Kelly had just done his last tour mm. um, and I met the astronauts. And so we had won the bid for the shuttle. They were like, okay, we're planning the parade. The shuttle's gonna be flown on the back of a 747 jet. It did three loops over the city. I had my child in a carrier 
I was standing on top of a garage near JPL, which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's like NASA's um, building out here. And I was watching, I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. I was watching this uh, huge shuttle on the back of a 747 do three loops over my head. And I was like, I think I'm going to quit my job. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That is quite a moment. I remember seeing that on TV. I was in, um, gosh, would have been in Cincinnati at that time too. But I like, yeah, I remember seeing that like, oh, that is one of the craziest things I've ever seen is how gigantic yeah. that shuttle is on top of that gigantic airplane. <laughs> yeah, it was wild. And I just, they, they were saying like, we know you're on maternity leave, but we really want you to come back. Um, there's lots of work to be done for this project. And I told my boyfriend at the time, then became my husband, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to quit. And I'm so grateful that he was very supportive, like, okay, whatever you want to do. But I just knew that I wanted to be with my kiddo. Like that was very clear to me. Uh, and I didn't know until I had him how I would feel about all that. So that being said, I had a very strong motivator for me to make this business work. And again, it was like, I'll give anything for this to work. And I remember in the beginning, like going on vacation and bringing my laptop with me mm -hmm. um, and like having projects and just like grateful for any type of work that I could get. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And also like excited, like it was a dopamine rush for me, like the results my clients were getting, but also the idea that I could take my work with me anywhere. But then there's this switch that happens where it's like, okay, I've got a business, I'm established. What are my priorities now that I figured out how to have a profitable business? So doing copy projects for my clients was still really lighting me up, but I was starting to look around and figure out like, how can I have still continue to make money in this business, but be less involved and have more free time for my kiddo and um, being with my husband. And I honestly, and I think this is natural, like I would feel guilty when I was working on things and we were supposed to be on vacation. Mm -hmm. um, so I started thinking about like, how can I create more time in my business? And so early on, I, I definitely tried to like launch a course. I think that's a natural thing service providers go and do to see if they can, because, you know, the marketing around it is so great. Stop trading dollars for hours kind of right, thing. Yeah. Um. So, and a lot of my peers were doing it. So I was like, let me try this and just see what happens. I think my first launch I sold for and I owed two affiliates money. Like it was not, <laughs> it was not what I expected it to be. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, I was like, okay, I know that working for private clients is very profitable for me. So why am I trying to abandon that? I need to go back to that. But the thing I need to do differently is I need to hire a project manager. So like year two of my business, I started to come up with this plan to take time off because I was like, I know that I don't need to work as much as I am. Like I'm set. My client work is good. Where can I find time? And so I came up with this really terrible plan. <laughs> and my project manager at the time, Kim Kaloka, I'll never forget. I was like, Hey, I think I want to take like every other Friday off every month. And do something fun. And she's like, why don't you just take the last week of the month off instead? And I was like, oh, right. Duh. Just batch the time that I went off. Mm -hmm. um, and so now for the ninth year in a row, I've been able to take four months off and I'm so grateful. It's like the best. Um, and so, you know, you have to work up to these things, but that's kind of how I got started was just like having a family and knowing that I wanted more free time. I, I know that, I mean, personally I can identify with that. Like I have, I have three kids who are 13, 11 and nine. Yeah. Um, and they were, you know, I launched X squared, um, my first business and my, my main business, uh, in January of 2021. So it's been three and a half years now, but before that I worked at a firm where like the culture was you're there all day. This is before mm. the pandemic, right? So we're, we're there, we're in the office all day. 
And Mm -hmm. then, you know, you go home and you have dinner and put your kids to bed and then hop back on Mm -hmm. and, you know, prep for your meetings the next, the next day at 10 PM. Right. And that's just like, all right, well, you're winding down with your glass of bourbon and maybe the TV's on and you're on your computer, you know, figuring Mm -hmm. stuff out or answering, answering emails. And that was, that was what was applauded. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, you know, when I, when I left that firm and created X squared and launched X squared, I was still in that in that mentality of like, if I'm going to work that hard for someone else, I might as well work that hard for myself. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was the part of what like got me through that first, first year, really, um, really similar to what you're saying, right? Like, like working a lot, like Mm -hmm. a lot, a lot, like seven days a week, all the time go to, you know, we're in Cincinnati families in Arizona. We'd go to Arizona. All right. Well, I've got meetings on, you know, all these different days we can fit in time with family you know, in other places. And I would say like really similar, that felt really empowering Mm -hmm. to me as well. Right. That was the phase of like, I I can do this. I can work from anywhere. I can proving like proving to myself that I could build a business that I could take with me in in a different way, build a financial planning firm even right. That, I mean, like that's almost unheard of Mm -hmm. to be able to be mobile and to be able to do that job. And um, and do it well and get new clients and sign new clients while I'm traveling. Like, I'm like, man, I'm a real badass right now. This is cool. <laughs> so, I love it. But yeah, the next couple of years, it's been, hey, how about I don't work at all when we leave? Right. Like, what does that feel like to take two weeks off mm-hmm. and have supports in place and let, you know, have have clients like have an awesome team that clients can call? If something is, if you actually need something, there is someone that can help you in like five minutes flat, like no worries, but I, we, we don't have a meeting on the calendar. Everything is good. You're squared away. I can take time off and I can actually do that. Um, so I, I think a lot of us, and my, so for me, for, I have clients who are the same kids who are roughly the same age or younger, um, or they don't have kids and they just are like. I need time. I can't work at this pace yeah. anymore. And so what I'm hearing from you, so tell me if this is true. So that taking that one, like that full week off per month, mm-hmm. is that what equals the four months over the year is by like building your schedule that way? Or how do you do it? Yeah. So it's one week off every month that accumulates to three months and then one month off every year. Sometimes I break it off into two two two-week chunks. So last year, I did two weeks in November and two weeks in December. I even took the first week of January off, so it ended up being a little bit more than four months uh, to go to London. And uh, yeah, so building it out like that. And also, I think for me and, and anyone who's listening, I do recommend that you give yourself a little grace around your plan, right? There are some times when I think I can have the week off and something breaks and I need to like look at things while I'm off. Uh, And it is fun though, because my team is like very aware, right? Like they know the plan and I try not to switch it up on them too much. Like it's always the last week of the month or, and I let them well know well in advance when that one month is coming or whatever it is. Um, but they're sweet. They're like, what are you doing? Stop writing me. You're off. <laughs> so they're kind of trained as much as I am. That just happened to me because I I wrote in about something because I get ideas sometimes even when I'm off and I'm like, oh, I don't want to forget this. They're like, stop typing in our, our, like our brain dump document that we have. What are you doing? <laughs> no, no, no. I just got to get it out. I, I find for me though, sometimes I need that. I, I need to like get whatever it is out of my head so that I can go back to relaxing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's fine. So, um, that's my thing, I guess though, the biggest thing I'll say for anybody who's thinking about taking time off is you really should come up with a plan for the next 12 months. And I know that seems like a stretch, but that's on purpose because even if you don't stick to that plan for the next 12 months, you're more likely to take more time off. If you mark off all of 
the government holidays now for me it's like the day the kids get out school even that whole week they get out of school because it's spirit week and I get to dress them for certain days and listen that takes a lot of mental bandwidth for me anyways that's not something that comes naturally to me um but yeah birthdays school holidays government stuff like take it now, write it down in your calendar. You will be way more likely to actually take the days off because for me anyways, like I just, I never liked when it was like the 4th of July is in the middle of the week here in the U S usually. And like, I'm supposed to do a bunch of calls that day. And I just want to be hanging out and not doing, you know, and my kids are home and I want to be hanging out with them. So just that advanced planning alone will make a huge difference. I, so I, completely agree. And I have found, so the last, definitely this past year, um, but I think even last year, I think for the last school year too, one of the things I had, um, so I have an executive assistant that is amazing. I I'll have her on the show actually at some point. Um, and we'll talk, but it's, I've, I had her go through with my kids school schedules. Yep. And so like mark off because my two kids um, go to one, my two older kids go to one school. My younger goes to a different school. Oh, wow. So they have different, different days off sometimes or different teacher paid days off. I have her go through with both calendars and like block all of their days off on my calendar. And so that was, that was one, that was one piece that was super, super helpful. So if you have kids and you can do that, right? Like again, ahead of time, when, as soon as you get that school calendar, mark it all off. Yeah. Um, holidays as well. And then, but I also, I also do birthdays and, yeah. you know, like even if the kids have school that day or if it's something like, I want to be able to decide if I'm going to do any, if I, if I'm going to add something, I get to make that decision versus it just being like, oh, this, this is on your, it was open. So I put it there or, you know, whatever can happen. I use Calendly for a lot of my scheduling, um, which is fabulous and I love it and it's very easy. But if I don't have those days blocked off, then people can just add meetings anytime, right? So yep. that's uh birthdays were a big one, anniversaries, um mm-hmm. my husband my anniversary uh anyway. And then what else did we do this past year? This one was new. This one was new. And so I'm I am working towards what you're saying right now. I I typically don't have recurring client meetings on the fourth week of the month. Um, and there, there's like, that is really appealing to me to somehow, Mm -hmm. even just to like, like shut it down for any meetings to go on to that. So again, so I can choose what I do that week. And then that could potentially lead to, well, what if I just take that week off each month? Like, I'd be down with that. Um, but what I did do recently was go through and block off kind of the, kind of the plan that you originally came up with. Um, but I kind of blocked off one day every two weeks as just off, just off. And I've never done that before. Uh, so yeah, that, that feels supportive to be like, it's a great way to start. Yeah. Like you don't have to have this big grand plan to take a bunch of time off. Cause it's something I built up to. I used to do one Friday a month, fun Fridays, and that was it. Um, and another thing that I've kind of dialed in, uh, besides these bigger chunks of time off is that I only do any meetings on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, um, Monday and Wednesday, It's very rare that I'll have any meetings on my calendar. And Wednesday is like my day to go do all my appointments and self-care stuff. And Monday is like an optional inbox day um, where if I feel like working, I will. But if I don't want to look at anything, I won't. Just because sometimes Mondays, I just need to ease into it. It's funny because yesterday I didn't do that. And I just want to like call myself out for a minute. Um, It was fun. I got to the end of Monday yesterday and I was like, why can't I sleep right now? (laughs) Like I didn't really want to sleep last night. And I realized it's because I went so hard on a Monday and my body's like, what are you doing? (laughs) Mm. Uh But I had taken the week off before and I got back on Monday and I just felt like I wanted, there were so many things that I had delayed, which was fine. Everybody knew it was being delayed. Um, but I just was like, I want to get all this done today. Ah, I'm working. And then I got to the end of the day and I was like, 
why can't I sleep? Oh, I did more than I usually do today. <laughs> yeah. Almost that like too much caffeine wired yeah. where it like, doesn't feel good. Right. Totally. And I hadn't drank any caffeine, but I was like, <laughs> it's my brain. It's that I was like, so fired up today, which was fun. Like I was happy to do the work, um, and just feel like I got a bunch of stuff off of my plate. And, uh, you know, it's like what you're feeling that day, but I think what I love about what you are saying, Hannah, and also what I'm echoing is that it's giving yourself the flexibility to make those choices in the moment, rather than being forced to doing, be doing more than you want to be doing. Um, and I love that you shared, like, even if my kids are going to school on their birthday, I want the option. Like, what if I did want to take them out and take them to a meal or go for a hike or do something fun? And that's like what I was in the mood for that day. Just giving yourself that flexibility rather than forcing yourself to do more is so powerful. And there is one other thing I want to share too. Like people ask me, you know, how do your clients feel about taking your time, all that time off? I don't tell them about it. <laughs> that is not something we have a conversation about. And like you said, having team members in place is great. Um, but even before I had as robust of a team as I have now, uh, just having the great standard operating procedures that my project manager helped me build out in my business, they didn't feel it when I was gone. Like if I was getting ready to take that week off, I never had a project start date. It was, they had intake forms to do before our project start date. So having little things like that, that make them feel very cared for, but don't require your time is something to really look at in your business so that you can start to feel comfortable about taking that time off. The other thing that I've heard, especially for people who are maybe solopreneurs and building into or adding team members uh, mm -hmm. and, and creating that support system that they need in order to have this, um, make it easier to take time, time away and actually be away, right? Not, not necessarily travel and work type thing, which again, it's great. You can, if you can work from anywhere, but if you don't want to, um, having team in place is critical, but also having your clients understand, right. Understand your team's role and understand mm -hmm. that like, there are certain things, like if this is what you need, you go to this person, right. That even though I am the face of my company, I'm the main person doing, um, like an X squared, doing the financial planning when, you know, certain forms or different things come through, it's people email my EA directly. Like they just, yeah. they just ask her, right. They go straight to her. They don't come to me for that, for everything. Um, and that's, that's that training aspect of establishing that it, it's sort of a boundary, but it's mostly just like an expectation of if you need mm -hmm. this, here are the people that you can go to for immediate help. Um, and immediate being also within their parameters of, you know, getting back in a timely manner, but it doesn't mean that we're like responding to your emails and text messages like a second later type thing. So yeah. it, it is, there is a training, um, an expectation, I think that you, that you go through with your clients rather than, you know, being the one that's like, well, if you respond to people on Saturday at 10 PM, they're going to expect that they can just email you. Right. And, and that's, that's when you're just always going to get to it. So I don't know, what do you, how do you feel about that? Like creating boundaries or, um, expectations for clients? Yeah. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with and that's normal to have that struggle, um, and find your way with it. And I definitely have some high level tips for people to avoid that scenario. Um, I have a whole training around this called work less, earn more. That's all about like, there's time boundaries, um, team building vision. Like there's so many things that go into this, but from a high level, a couple of things is first of all, to, I love that you said, like introduce them to your team, tell them what their role is, um, from the very beginning, like scheduling, even scheduling calls with me. Um, or once they make their payment, they start interacting with my um, business manager. So they're used to hearing from her, but I do have to sometimes step back. Like I'm tempted to respond to things that I know I could handle in two minutes. And mm -hmm. so part of it is keeping yourself in <laughs> rather than keeping other people out. 
So I have to sit back and let my team do their job. I think that's a big deal. Like if you want to start working with a business manager or an executive assistant, it's like, oh, I could get this done so fast. That's the attitude a lot of people have. Like, why would I wait for someone else to do this? I could get this done so fast. Yes, you can. But if you don't let people do their job, then for one, they're not going to know who's on your team and who's supposed to support them with those types of things, but they're just going to keep coming to you. So be careful of that. I think it's like something people don't even realize they're doing or why that is an issue. Um, and especially people who are used to working on their own, like they have a hard time stepping back and letting their team jump in. Um, the other thing that we do that I don't see other copywriters do, which I have from the beginning, it's been like a non-negotiable for me, is when I onboard my client, I think it's cute. Like copywriters will be like, oh, I'll send you a draft and then you let me know what you think. And what they're actually doing when they send that draft and then they're waiting for the client to get back to them is hoping that the client doesn't get back to them quickly because they have other things they need to work on. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that is a huge mistake. So for any service providers, you set the tone and the timeline of the entire project. It makes people feel safer to work with you rather than it just being an open-ended like, when are we going to next communicate? I don't know. I'm just waiting to hear from the client. So for me, um, I don't always work in this capacity, but when I used to, I want to share it with people. And then I'll tell you how I've switched my business model, actually. So I used to do three meetings and two revisions, but I set those meeting times. So project start meeting, revisions meeting, wrap meeting. And I said, it's this day, this day, this day, these times, do you approve these? Yes, I get their approval, but then no one is guessing when anything uh -huh. happens. It's uh, called a waterfall-based project management system. And that's what I learned partially from working with Kim back in the day. Um, so I loved that. That served my business so well because everybody knew when things were happening, there were intake forms to get them started. And then we had these three meetings and two revisions. It was very clear. Um, and then in the last five years, I've switched to doing VIP days. So I basically took those three meetings that used to happen over several weeks and condensed them to working with clients in a VIP day format where we can get everything done in like a half day or a full day. Mm. And the level of clients that I work with, they love this because they're buying their time back, right? Like now we don't have to spread out our project and everything can get condensed and done. Uh, so I'm in love with this new format of working. I'm curious, Hannah, have you tried VIP days at all? Do you do them with your clients? I have not. Um, it's a little bit different, but so I was going to, um, with financial planning, totally. yeah, yeah. But I, I can relate in some way. So there are, um, the thing that really resonated for me is the level, again, the level of clients that I work with and the type of people that I work with, uh, yeah. If you leave things open-ended like that, it, it there, it's like, no, that's, I, I, they have so many while. other, right. It, they have so many other things going on that yeah. it's like, great. You just added something to like the open bucket of like 6,000 other things that I have to get back to. And that is not supportive and it doesn't feel safe and they don't feel held. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I realized with the clients that I work with and desired to work with is that mm -hmm. they need to be held their hands. They are fully capable, functioning, amazing, bright, brilliant adults. And yes. when they're, when they're paying for help, they actually do want to be handheld and, yes. and walked through a process. So what I do, that's different than a lot of financial planners. Um, some financial planners will say, Hey, if we have one 90 minute meeting, I can turn around and give you a financial plan that is going to hit all your, all your needs. Mm-hmm. And that's great. And that's beautiful. And I applaud that. And like, that's a great system. I actually go through like a series of meetings with my clients instead. And because they have to, with the other style, they have to do homework. They have to send in documents. They have to do all kinds of prep work. They have to come back right with all the stuff. Kind of like you're saying, oh, well, I told them I needed these different statements and I'm waiting for them to get back to me. Mm-hmm. And then again, that puts something on the client. Instead, I create a container where this meeting, we're going to gather all your PDFs and all your data, and we're going to do it together. 
this oh, meeting, we're going to talk yeah. about, yeah, we're do all your spending, all your budgeting. We're going to look at your PL for your business. We're going to create something similar for your household and we're going to do it together. I'm not going to send you homework. I'm not going to be like, all right, you now you need to go spend two hours and do this on your own. No, we're going to do it together right now. And so I've created a space where, yeah, they, they don't have to do anything else. They just come and meet with me. And then at the end of the process, they have this extremely robust financial plan. That's exactly what they desire. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's the same. It's like, okay, meeting one is this meeting two is this meeting three is this right. And it's, and the system is set VIP days would be powerful. And I like the thing that kind of comes to me with that is like, it almost feels like it might be too much, right? Mm -hmm. Like for the different, the different aspects of finances that we go through, it's a lot of it is a lot of emotional mining um, mm -hmm. as well. And so it can be a little bit like, I, I've had clients tell me this before, like they need to actually slow the process down a little bit just so that it's really, they can be present with it and not mm -hmm. like, you're totally good. We'll split this out. Okay. Give me one sec. Okay. We're coming back to recording. We had a little pause there. Um, but we were talking about the VIP day and the structure for, um, financial planning in particular, where I've, I've had clients who really needed to like slow the process down in order to, uh, have their nervous system catch up with, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's happening and understanding their money. Um, and so because of the way that I work and, and how I work with people that it comes up pretty often, actually, that we just like, we actually need to take pauses. We need to take breaks. We need to explore what story is coming up around money when we talk about their income or their revenue or their savings or, um, whatever it is, it's, it's really fascinating to be able to make space for that. Um, that said, I love, I have had VIP days before with different coaches and I love them. I think it's, yeah, you can just, when you get to go deep on something and like really flesh something out and like when you're in the creative flow of a project, it's really powerful to be able to like, kind of like see it through rather than be like, all right, there's our hour. We'll, you know, catch up next week. Yeah, I love a couple of things you said. So of course, like that's beautiful that you acknowledge that people need to reset their nervous system around financial work. Like that's a real thing that comes up. And I always tell people like, make it work for you in terms of what do you enjoy doing? Because people always ask me some very funny questions. Like, do I have to have food for them on their VIP day? And I'm like, well, I don't like feeding people. I'll just be honest. I'll book you a massage, but I'll just make sure that wherever I host it, there's incredible food on site that they can order or I can order for. Like, I don't need to be considering all those things. I'm not that person. So you get to decide like, who are you as the business owner and how do you want to craft it? Because people just have these funny like expectations and set things that they think have to happen in a VIP day. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's based on your strengths, skills and things that you love to do. Um, so that you can show up in your zone of genius and serve them at the highest possible level. And I also like with financial planners, I've had people who use it just for one very specific thing in their business. And I can give you an example. So it was helping people with their back taxes. If they had oh, if yeah. they needed their back taxes cleaned up and they could get it done in a VIP day, like that's how they specifically did it rather than it have be like their signature service that they do for clients over time. Cause I get that that takes time for sure. Um, but finding like one specific slice or even just like strategic tax planning, mm -hmm. have a VIP day just for that. And so it was a great way for people to get a taste of their service without being committed to working them with them over the long term. And then they could decide like, oh, I actually really love that experience. Now I want more. But it's definitely, I think, like a stepping stone service for some business owners versus their main signature service. And so, yeah, and I will say like as a copywriter, I have the advantage that people come to me. There's a, a certain cohort of people who are like, I want to launch like yesterday. And I'm like, great, you are meant for the VIP day. Versus if I have a new client coming to me, they have a very robust digital footprint and there's going to be a lot of projects for us to do. 
I'm fluid about it. If they're like, no, I don't want to do a VIP day. Like I want the longer three meetings, two revisions to get to know each other and like really dive deep on my brand and all those things. I'm like, great, we can spread it out. So I do keep things very fluid because especially like in this time that we're in, you have to go above and beyond for customers to want to work with you. Like competition is fierce. Um, and, you know, business is very much in flux right now. Like things have changed quite a bit with, of course, like the pandemic, I felt like the tide was in my favor because I had already been in the online space. You know, I've been in business for 12 years. So when that happened, I don't wish that world scenario on all of us. But I was just like, now everybody's coming to my world and they're trying to figure out ways to make money online because suddenly they're sitting at home and they have more time with no boss over their shoulder. Um, and then like watching with the inflation happen, that has been really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I have found that people are once again looking for faster solutions And so that's been really amazing to be able to step up and like say, yeah, I've got VIP days that can support you. Um, And so, yeah, it's been really interesting to watch just like all the things that have changed. But um, I think and, and at least in my industry, like a lot of my peers had masterminds that they were offering that suddenly weren't selling. So they had to pivot quickly and figure out what is the next thing I'm going to sell. And VIP days were like a way for them to go back to private client work because they couldn't scale their business like they used to, but they could. And I think that's the one thing I want people to understand is that people don't think that private client work is scalable, but it very much is. Um, And I've even had copywriters on my team support a VIP day for a client. Like it's not always me having to do the work. So I just, I love to share all of this because I think it kind of opens up people's minds to something that they weren't thinking about before. Oh, I, I think that's so important um, because yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I do feel like there's been, there's a, just the landscape is changing and what people mm-hmm. are willing to pay for is changing and buyers are getting more um, discerning right now. Right. Like that's, that's absolutely a thing that's happening and having, I, I call that being able to meet people where they're, where they're at. Mm -hmm. And so, and I've, I've found that too, like having more flexibility, um, like my offering used to be, you know, we're going to do the financial plan and then we meet monthly Mm -hmm. and and there's a monthly retainer. There's an upfront fee for the plan. Then there's a monthly retainer. Um, and for some people that wasn't the right fit, that's not what they needed for other people. That is what they want and need, right. They want yeah. that monthly, um, touch base and communication and, and all of that. But it's been interesting to allow myself to open up to different possibilities. Right. And, and see this, I, I agree too. I think, I think one-on-one work is, is scalable, but actually it's also needed. People need that customization right now. I know that's, you know, I'm, I've had, um, a wonderful, you know, almost full year so far of having clients come even during, you know, while other businesses are having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of the, like the amount of personalization that I put into what I'm doing and where people are like, like they don't want the cookie cutter, course that's going to say, okay, here's the generic information. You figure it out. You make it work for your situation. They want, they want someone who can say, okay, here's the, here's the general advice. Here's the one that actually fits for you. And here's why Mm -hmm. you walked through that in a different way. Um, you know, from my, from my perspective or from your perspective, like, like let's actually do the thing right. Versus like, here's how you write your copy. Like, what if they just want you to do it, like how, talk it out and have you do it for them. Right. Like that's, that's the thing buying their time back. Like you said, yeah, it's so powerful, but also like being able to identify your buyers within your audience is the thing that I've been the most excited about helping my customers and my clients do this year is like understanding that, um, there are people who want 
there there are still people who want the DIY. Like I, I have a copy template membership and we added 353 customers between December and February. Mm-hmm. And they are people. So I say that though, because I've been in business for 12 years. So I have a wide range of both emerging and established business owners. And both of them come into the membership for different reasons. Sometimes the more established folks will bring in their team rather than mm-hmm. them. So they're getting like some really great support around their copy through their team, up-leveling their skills. So there's still a market for things, but what you said about people being more discerning, that part, like you really have to be strong and know what you're doing in terms of your framework that you're teaching and you have to stand out. Mm -hmm. If you don't, like if you don't do, like you were saying, your personalized touches, that is what attracts people to you and you knowing that that's unique about you as a financial planner you are not going to make it in this market. And I wish that wasn't true. Business was easier, I would say, three years ago, for sure, um, versus now. And so it's it's okay, though. Like, the good news is, um, as long as you get really clear on those things, you will stand out in the market, and people will find you, and they will refer you, and they will remember you for the work that you're doing. And that part's amazing. Um, and then, like, also being able to identify those buyers who are never going to do your DIY stuff and don't ignore the fact that there's some people who are never going to be that type of customer and just understanding these different buyer frame of minds Mm -hmm. and how to sell to them is really like what I love to do, like doing market research. And I think this is my biggest thing for everyone to take away from this conversation is like, if you think that you want to do VIP days, great. Like if it sounds like, ooh, that's so cool. I want more white space on my calendar. I want to make to- have more time off, spend it with my family or spend it with my friends or spend it pursuing hobbies because you forgot what those are because you're an entrepreneur and you put your whole business is your whole hobby. <laughs> but now you're like, wait, I am a person outside of my business. What do I like to do? Um, I really recommend that you ask your audience if they want it. It's that simple. Ask them, if I offer VIP days, is this something you would want? Mm -hmm. That is like a very boiled down, simple version of doing market research. And then if people raise their hand and say, yes, I want this on social or through email campaigns or however you market yourself, have a conversation with them. Tell them, this is what I'm thinking about creating. What do you think of it? Would you want something different? Does this sound good? But that's my biggest recommendation is like have a conversation with your audience. It doesn't mean you have to offer it either. If you like start to explore it with some people in the in the background and you're like, this doesn't sound fun to me, then don't do it. It's yeah. all good. Um, but I do think that like having a variety of offers, keeping it fluid, like we were talking about, you know, I would not want a monthly meeting with a financial planner. I would want, and I do do like a quarterly meeting because Mm -hmm. anything more than that, I can't, I'm like, no, (laughs) I don't want more meetings on my calendar. That's not the point of my business. Right. (laughs) So it's fun to like get into people's minds and like really have these conversations. But I think what people get nervous about is that feels like a form of asking and selling to them. And it's okay. Like there are ways to naturally have these conversations. Um, and, you know, learning how to naturally have these conversations is a really important skill in your business. Um, and it doesn't, it, it takes people a little bit to get over themselves to actually have, you know, ask more and, and have these, these conversations happen and then understand how to discern the conversation as market research and turn it into a viable product. Mm. Oh yeah. I love that. And the last, the last thing I want to say before we, um, switch it up and ask people, tell people where they can find you is that I did have an experience recently, um, with a friend who I connect with at least a few times a year. Um, we have awesome Mm -hmm. conversations and I had time blocked off when I was going on vacation. Um, with my kids, we were going to Disney world with family, husband, kids, all everyone. Um, and then I had some time blocked off around that as well. And when she looked at my calendar to book, she asked if there was, she's like, Oh, this is like blocked off. Is there any time earlier? And I said, there's not. Um, 
that's you know that's that's what my calendar is and she came back after and was like I have to say I am so thankful that you have that example uh, because I was feeling like if someone wants to meet with me I have to move things around to make it work Mm -hmm. rather than say that's actually my availability right now and it's okay if we meet in three weeks I'll be so happy to see you in three weeks it's so good right yeah and those are my best clients they all say like I really admire anytime they ask me for something I'm like nope but when I get back here's the day you're gonna hear from me they always tell me they really admire it and it's just confirmation that we're totally doing it in a way that honors everyone right exactly and it's giving permission to those other business owners to to think about doing something similar right that's That's the important yes. part. They need those examples and reminders. Right. Yes. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> so Sage, thank you so much for being here with me. I would love for you to share if people have questions, if they want to know more. Um, yeah. How do people get in touch with you? Where do they find you? Yeah. So I'm pretty active on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so please feel free to DM me. I answer the fastest on Instagram. So I'm at Sage Polaris. My Facebook, I don't have Facebook Messenger on my phone. So um, often you'll hear back from my team because they check it more often than I do. And then if you just want to get into my world and like hear me talk more about this topic, uh, July is the perfect month because I'm actually going to be hosting an open house around VIP days. It's just a place to come ask more questions about what we've already started, the conversation we started today. And um, I also have a free gift for your audience, if it's okay if I share that. Absolutely. Yay. All right. So if you just want to get my world, go to sageplayers.com slash Hannah rocks, because she does. <laughs> and you can get my triple email open rates. It's three emails that you can copy, paste, and personalize. Uh, for my service providers, if you have ghosted your list, this will allow you to reappear into your potential client's inbox. Um, you'll know exactly what to say. It'll help you do a little bit of market research, and you can get ready to make an offer that will land with your audience. If you've had a list for a long time and you've never removed unengaged subscribers, you can also use these templates so that you can get rid of anybody who hasn't opened your emails in the last 90 days. So I love people using this tool go to sageplayers.com slash hannah rocks and you can check all that out and then you'll just be in my world and you can hear me talk more about this conversation we started today amazing thank you so much sage for coming and sharing this wisdom um and just yeah, opening up this conversation uh in such a beautiful way so if for anyone who's listening if you have any questions at all you know you can always find me at hannah h-a-n-n-a-h at expansiveceo.com uh, and for sage all of her information is going to be in the show notes below so you can go and check her out um get her templates all of those beautiful things so thank you again for being here it was such a pleasure Yeah, I appreciate you opening up your circle. It was awesome to talk to everyone. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and be sure to like and subscribe. And again, if anything resonated with you from this episode, I would love to hear from you. Email me at hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H, at expansiveceo.com and tell me about it. And if you're ready for your greatest expansion, You can find ways to work with me at ExpansiveCEO.com and at XSquaredWealthPlanning.com. That's X, the numeral two, WealthPlanning.com. So until next time, remember that there is enough, you are enough, and your birthright in this lifetime is to be expansive.